We're back continuing our discussion of variational inference with Xanda. This time we're focusing on an example of deriving variational inference for LDA. Needless to say, if you don't know the basics of variational inference, you should watch the first video. It's linked below. All right, let's go through how you derive variational inference for a real model, latent Dirichlet allocation. I should point out that the notation is a little different from when we talked about Gibbs sampling. I'm following the 2003 JMLR journal paper by Dave Bly et al. Dave was my advisor, and pointing out relationships to various equations in that paper, and they use a different variable scheme than what people started using in the late aughts. Yes, the original LDA paper is a classic. All right, here we go. You first start out with the joint distribution, which is a product over the documents in which each document distribution theta over topics is drawn from a Dirichlet distribution parameterized by alpha. The next is simpler. For each token in the document, you draw a topic assignment z of d comma n from the topic distribution theta. It's just a multinomial distribution, so you just multiply the appropriate index from the vector theta. Actually, and this might be a little bit pedantic, technically that's not a <laughs> technically that's not a multinomial distribution. A multinomial draw is a vector with counts. That's right. Uh, this is a bad habit that I picked up from Dave Bly, uh, and it's at odds with, say, what you would see on Wikipedia. Uh, the slides will still say multinomial, and because of Dave's bad influence, I will say multinomial as well. Though, so folks at home should think about this as a single draw from a vector, i.e. a roll of a die. Sounds good, and that convention ends up being pretty widespread in my experience. So if you say multinomial, a lot of people will know that that's what you mean. Right. So drawing a word from a topic is another, you could say categorical distribution or multinomial distribution, but this time indexing is a little more complicated. We have k different multinomial distributions beta, one for each topic, but right now we're interested in just the topic word multinomial distribution from the topic assignment z sub d comma n for document index d and token index within document n. Then the element of that vector is indexed by the observed token associated with index d comma n, which is word d w sub d comma n. That's one term in the product, but there are several dependent pieces. I think it might be good to see a picture to review and to tie this back to our Gibbs sampling discussion. A distribution over topics per document and an assignment of tokens to topics. Each of these has a distribution. Dirichlet, categorical or multinomial, and then categorical or multinomial again. And some of these also have a variational distribution. Only some? Why doesn't beta get a variational distribution? Why is it left out? The original LDA paper treated it as a parameter rather than as a random variable. So it's actually still optimized with respect to the elbow, but it's a free parameter, so it doesn't have a distribution. This is different from the LDA that we talked about for Gibbs sampling, where it also had a Dirichlet prior. That's right, and it also gives you an idea of what you can do for hyperparameters like those Dirichlet parameters. You can actually just optimize it explicitly. Okay, then our variational distribution for the variables that do remain is quite a bit simpler courtesy of our mean field assumption. Uh, for each document, we have a variational Dirichlet, gamma d, and then every token has a variational distribution phi, of d comma n over the topic as used by each token. Yes, and even though they're both vectors, they're not the same. The phi vector has to sum to 1 and be non-negative, but the gamma vector parameterizes a Dirichlet distribution, so it doesn't actually have to sum to 1.0. In fact, topic models often have these sum to a smaller number, as that tends to correspond to making uniform distributions less likely and sparser distributions more likely. But to write out our objective function, we need to take the expectation of a Dirichlet distribution 
and then take the log of that probability. Right. So we won't derive this here since it has some hairy math, but the only difficult identity that you need is the expectation of the log probability of a Dirichlet distribution parameterized by alpha. And that's going to be the digamma function of alpha minus the digamma function of the sum of the alpha parameters. What the heck is a digamma function? It's when you really hate gamma functions and you just, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. Remember the gamma function from the Dirichlet distribution? Yeah, it's the generalization of the factorial function to real numbers. Yeah, not just real numbers, also complex numbers. But perfect. And the digamma function is just the derivative of the log of the gamma function. It seems like this will be useful. I get it. I guess let's start going through the expectations of the objective function for LDA. Thanks to the properties of the log, taking the log of the joint probability means that we can turn this into sums of logs, which we'll work through in turn, breaking it down into three expectations and then the entropy terms. The first one is for the document distribution over topics. But we're fortunate because this is just the same thing as the identity that we just saw. Not so fast, and this is where it starts getting hairier. So that's the expectation of a Dirichlet given a known parameter. That's not exactly what we're doing here. We're doing the expectation of theta from the Dirichlet parameter alpha, but under a different variational distribution parameterized by gamma. Oh, okay. Gamma is a parameter of the Dirichlet distribution we care about. So we need to separate everywhere theta appears from the constants, then take the expectation with respect to that. Exactly. The first step is to just write down the Dirichlet distribution. The first part with the gamma functions is just a constant. So let's separate the product and turn it into a sum of logs. So now we have the identity that we had earlier. So we just bring the constant of alpha i minus one outside the log and make the substitution of the log Dirichlet. The next expectation is over the documents distribution over topics. Are there any scary functions there? Not really scary, but bear with me. The notation can be a little off-putting. We're going to be using indicator functions. What's an indicator function? Honestly, it's a math-friendly if statement. I for if, if you want to remember it that way. It evaluates to one when the input is true and zero otherwise. Okay, easy enough. So why do we need the indicator function here? In this case, a document only uses some of the topics and which topics it uses is governed by the topic assignments Z sub n. In the joint distribution, this is reflected by theta raised to the topics the document uses. So the indicator is like an if statement saying if word n uses topic i, then include theta i in this product. Exactly. I love it. But because this is a log probability, it becomes a sum over logs. But what happens to an exponent when we take the log? See, this is why I love logs. You just multiply that log by the exponent. And then the expectation of the indicator function is just the probability of that underlying event, which is phi sub n comma i. Okay, and we can just plug in the expectation entropy that we saw before. This time it's okay, since theta actually does come from the variational parameter gamma. That means we're done. Uh, do we need indicators for the next expectation? Yes, and forgive me, it's slightly more complicated. We're taking a big product of a bunch of multinomial parameters, but not all of the entries in the beta matrix. Ah, only some words are being used in a given document. And only some topics are being used. So the indicator is only turning on for some of the entries. Yeah, if we knew the actual values. But since we're taking expectations, we're looking at vectors of possible outcomes instead of singular topic assignments. So they're not really turning on or off. The variational parameter phi sub n comma i says how much token n uses topic i. Okay, so since this is a big product, we can do the same log trick and turn this into a sum of logs. 
But then we have a log of theta, uh, which we can substitute again. Perfect. The final terms are the entropy of the variational Dirichlet and multinomial. But let's not go through those since you can always just look this part up, which is frankly what I always do. Okay, so now we have an objective function. From working with neural models, I know that we could now just code up a module in PyTorch with the appropriate forward, backward methods, and then we're done. Yes, you could, you could totally do that. But believe it or not, we can actually compute closed form solutions of this friendlier objective function. That's one of the advantages of variational inference. We've simplified things to a point where it's actually tractable. I don't know if I'd call this friendly. If you have a variational distribution, there's always a closed form solution. It's not a given for all variational distributions, but you get to pick which distribution you use. For distributions like these, you can do a little strategic work to get a variational distribution that does let you do closed form updates. Okay, so we look at the objective function, take the partial derivative with respect to whatever variational parameter we're optimizing, set that equal to zero, and then solve for the new values, new setting of the variational parameter that optimizes the objective function. Exactly. That's going to be our workflow. So let's go through the updates real quick. For phi, how much the model thinks token n will be associated with topic i? Just a little bit of algebra actually gives you the answer. You can multiply beta, the exponent of the digamma of gamma sub i, minus the digamma function of the sum of the gamma j's. Which makes sense. It looks a lot like the Gibbs sampling update combining how much the topic likes the word and how much the document likes the topic. Yeah, it's just not quite as friendly because of that pesky digamma function. But the digamma function is monotonic, so as gamma gets bigger for a topic, you'll get more for that coordinate of phi. The update for gamma, how much the document likes a topic, is a little more difficult. What's that mark next to the digamma function? So, so I heard you like derivatives. In this case, even though the digamma function is itself the derivative of the log of the gamma function, we're going to need to take the derivative of that. So digamma prime is the derivative of the digamma function. So how the heck do we solve when this is equal to zero? Thankfully, it turns out you can ignore the digamma function. If you stare at the whole thing, you can see the only way to make this zero is when the terms with alpha, phi, and gamma are zero. So then the update is fairly intuitive in the end. It's almost like you're summing up the expected counts for how much the document uses a topic over all words, and then smoothing it with the hyperparameter alpha. Yes, and again, this should remind you of Gibbs sampling. It's just that rather than using real counts, we're doing the expected counts from the variational distribution. Then the only thing left is the probability of a word given a topic. Yes, you're right. This part is a little more complicated because it requires Lagrange parameters, but if we skip to the end, it again looks a lot like what you do for Gibbs sampling. You just have expected counts, and you set it proportional to that. But why did we put a Dirichlet prior on one of the distributions and not on the others? Keen observation. The JMLR paper that people cite for LDA doesn't put Dirichlet smoothing on the topic word distributions. It mentions this idea vaguely as smoothed LDA. It turns out that as early as, I think, 2004, when Griffiths and Staver's paper came out explaining the efficient Gibbs sampling approach you talked about before, People just started including that smoothing anyhow, and now if you say LDA, people will usually assume you're doing that. Though I think it'd be fun to call it like double Dirichlet. But let's follow the JMLR presentation to stay consistent. Okay, uh, that's how we update a parameter, but how do I actually fit a model? It's really not all that different from the gradient updates we talked about before. You initialize the parameters somehow. Unlike gradient updates, though, it's a pretty bad idea to use uniform initialization because that can sometimes be a local optimum. Ah, and the inherent randomness of gradient updates gets you out of that. Yeah, sometimes, but honestly, it's probably just a good idea to initialize randomly either way. Just make sure to use random seeds if you ever need to debug so that you can recreate the randomness. Then, we're going to go through and update the parameters. You can often distribute your local parameters 
gamma and phi to subprocessors or other machines, and then update beta for the whole data set. Do you really need to compute the elbow, aka the objective function L? Technically, you don't, which I'm sure is a little disappointing after all that effort. But if you follow this recipe, you're right, it should just work. However, in real life, you often have bugs in this sort of code, including bugs that still let the model apparently converge just to an incorrect spot. Double checking that your objective function actually improves makes sure that things are working as intended. This is all very interesting, but are the closed form updates always better? You got me. <laughs> nope, sometimes doing gradient descent is actually faster for really large data sets. Even back in 2009, Matt Hoffman showed that online variational updates converged faster for big models and produced decent models. And he had to do the implementation by hand without the benefit of PyTorch. So <laughs> why did we go through all of the closed form updates for LDA? Well, to understand the paper, we really need to go through the updates. And for smaller data sets, the closed form updates are likely to converge faster for you. So how do we actually implement this kind of algorithm with a minimum of pain? There are a couple broad suggestions for that that are good suggestions in general for model development. First, don't over-optimize your code. It's a really easy way to introduce bugs. Start by using toy or synthetic data with known parameters to see how well you do. Uh, like we said before, use fixed seeds for your random number generator so that you can repeat bad behavior. And don't go too low level in the implementation unless it can't be helped. Then there's the broader machine learning nuts and bolts. Use unit tests. Don't use real data until you've confirmed that your model works with fake synthetic data, where you know the answer the algorithm is supposed to find, and match the names of variables in your write-up. Actually, a cheat I learned from my co-author Aaron Shine is to put both the name of the variable and the dimensions of the data structure, for instance, k and v, in the variable name for each thing you infer, so that you know the shapes of everything you're dealing with. Finally, monitor the objective function during optimization. The last bit is always important, but more so for variational inference, because it's the first sign that you screwed up your derivation somehow. Uh, what's some advice that's specifically useful for variational inference? Well, unit tests, like I said before, they're always a good idea, but they're even more useful for variational inference because the updates are actually deterministic. Given a particular configuration of the other variational parameters, it is clear what your update should be. Given that everything is deterministic, this also means that the objective must always go up, right? So if your objective ever goes down, you know you have a bug. Exactly. That is unlike Gibbs sampling, where the training likelihood can totally go down if you get a bad roll of the random number generator. Another way to check your progress is to visualize the variational distributions. They usually get more focused over time, starting off fairly uniform. One way of doing this is to just write out the complete state of your algorithm. That's a nice thing that PyTorch does for you. It is a handy tool. Finally, one very specific tip for variational inference that will speed things up is that the gamma and digamma function situation is pretty slow, and you'll often be evaluating it again and again on basically the same inputs. So you can put a cache decorator to speed things up quite a bit. It's probably a drop in the memory bucket to do this compared to the amount of space the variational parameters for your latent variables take up. OK, I'm still kind of confused about how batch variational inference like this compares to other approaches and why you choose it over one or the other. Sure, so let's wrap up with a review of our different methods. We already talked about Gibbs sampling, which is good for prototyping simple probabilistic models. Well, if Gibbs sampling is easier, why not use it for everything? Gibbs sampling is easier, but it only works if every pair of random variables is what we call conjugate. Well, I guess that means that all of them in LDA are conjugate, but what does that mean more generally? It's a statistical term that means the posterior of a distribution has the same form as a prior. Things like the Dirichlet distribution and the multinomial distribution, or categorical distribution, form a conjugate pair. A Dirichlet prior on a multinomial variable, for instance, like we had for our document topic distribution. At the most basic level, it means a lot of gross things cancel out to give us a clean, closed-form way to sample. 
For many models, this isn't a problem. People in particular like to use distributions from the exponential family, which include a lot of your favorite distributions and have lots of fabulous conjugate pairs, but it sometimes constrains your creativity if you have to keep that property of conjugacy to figure out your models. So this explains why Gibbs sampling was dominant for about a decade, but now most topic model inference algorithms that I see are variational. What changed? That's a good question. I think the emergence of toolkits like PyTorch allowed people to do updates of the elbow objective functions a lot more easily. So now you can write your model as a bunch of forward and backward modules, and then PyTorch does the rest. Batching, update parameters, and saving state. It also makes life easier because you can combine or contrast with neural models, which as y'all know are pretty popular. So writing a complete model update from scratch is still as unpopular as ever? Exactly. But sometimes it's unavoidable, so it's a good skill to have in your toolset. Okay, great. I think that's all for variational inference for LDA. Uh, thank you so much for explaining variational inference generally and walking through this specific example of how to derive it for latent Dirichlet allocations, Anda. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to be here. If you want to see more videos like this, check the video description for the course that comes from the link down below. You can then see the context and the correct order for watching these videos. YouTube will gleefully show you stuff in the wrong order. If you want other people to see this video, provide a big gradient to the recommendation algorithm by clicking the like and subscribe button down below.